Now, you'll recall from uh, very, very early on in the semester, when the economists talk about costs, they're talking about opportunity costs. They're talking about lost opportunities. Now, in macroeconomic terms, lost opportunities here is referring to lost output. The, the lost opportunity to produce output. Now, what that means is, it has an interesting implication. If inflation causes output to fall, inflation itself, not some phenomenon which is indirectly related to inflation, but the inflation itself causes unemployment, then we would say that there, are, there is a cost to inflation. If, on the other hand, it turns out that the presence of inflation, the phenomenon of inflation, increasing prices, does not actually cause output to be lost, then there is no cost to inflation to the economy as a whole. Then there's no cost to the economy as a whole. That's a separate question from the redistribution issue which we already talked about. There can be winners and losers, but overall, for the economy as a whole, does output fall or not? If it does, then we say that's a cost of inflation. If output does not fall, then we say there's no cost of inflation. Although there are winners and losers, there's no overall cost of inflation to the economy as a whole. All right. Now, there are two kinds of costs of inflation which are um, standard and usually regarded as uh, uh, present in all modern economies. And these are unavoidable costs. One is shoe leather costs, and the other is menu costs. Shoe leather costs refers to the costs associated um, with checking prices uh, having to constantly check prices as a consumer, having to constantly check prices, which might be changing all the time. Right? The general level of prices is changing, so but different products are changing at different rates. At a fairly in a in a fairly rapid way, if it's occurring in a fairly rapid way, then there are costs associated with going and checking and figuring out where the best prices are and so on. There's also costs associated with constantly having to go to the bank, uh, get money out uh, and spend it uh, in short bursts as prices are changing. Now this is called shoe leather cost from, because of its, there's, you can see it's a term coming from an earlier age where you would wear out shoe leather by walking around, by engaging these transactions, cost money. So if the costs of engaging in transactions, just getting transactions done, increases due to inflation, then we say there's a cost of inflation. Because that's resources being devoted to just coping with inflation. Another is menu costs. Menu costs refer to the costs associated with constantly having to physically change the prices of everything. So, for those of you who are old enough, you'll remember way back when that supermarkets, before they had the beep beep machines, uh, used to have little price tags on every single product in the store. So every can of baked beans had a little tiny price ticket on it. And someone would have to go around and put the prices, price tickets, on every single item in the store. Now, if inflation's occurring, then you have to go around putting price new prices on every single item in the store every six months or so. Which means a little army of people has to be employed just to change the prices of the items in the store. And that's occurring across the entire country. So there's resources devoted, just wasted in a sense, just changing price labels um, because prices have gone up. 
So this could be classified as a waste of resources that could have been used to produce actual goods and services. Anyway, I think that, well, should say that the, the, the estimate from the United States anyway, I don't know for Australia, the estimate of these costs uh, is reasonably small. It's generally estimated to be about a quarter of a percent of GDP. If you could get unim uh, sorry, if you can get the inflation to zero, the idea would be if you can get inflation to zero and thereby eliminate these shoe leather and menu costs, then GDP would increase by a quarter of a percent. So, which is not really very much. Anyway, uh, I think that this cost, not only is small by common estimates now, I think it will be smaller and smaller in the future. We know that shoe leather costs uh, are falling rapidly thanks to the virtues of the internet. Now you don't have to spend a lot of time and effort checking the prices of goods as they change by physically moving around to find them. Now I can check changes in the price of a good that's sold in Omaha in the United States in one second. Uh, the capacity to check at changes in price is virtually or is almost costless these days. So shoe leather costs I think are rapidly disappearing. Menu costs I think are also rapidly disappearing. Today you don't have any shop putting little little price stickers on individual products anymore. It's all computerized. We all have our beep, the beep beep machines now exist, uh, where all of those prices are recorded. You don't have to, um, you don't have to uh, put a, as many resources into changing prices as was the case in the past. Now, aside from those, so we've got those particular types of costs, and I've argued that one, those particular types of costs, shoe leather costs and menu costs, are very small and will probably diminish to, uh, to almost non-existent in the future. Does that mean there are no costs of inflation? Well, no, it doesn't mean that. As with so much of economics, it all depends. Now, if inflation is anticipated, can be anticipated, is expected, then inflation is not necessarily a problem at all. It won't necessarily lead to any costs. If it's anticipated, then people can just take that into account. They can take the predicted unemployment uh, inflation rate into account in their dealings so that they're not affected. It would be kind of like saying, look, I know, everyone knows that prices are going to increase by X percent in the next year. So all we need to do is stick zeros on the end of all of our contracts, say, something like that. And we just stick zeros on the all of our contracts, nothing else changes. No one's any worse off, no one's any better off. So take the example of a wage contract. Say you want to maintain your current standard of living. You, if you know, or if you correctly anticipate that inflation is going to be 5%, then you know when you negotiate your contract that that increase you're going to have to get a pay rise of 5% in order to maintain your current standard of living now if you do that then you're unaffected by inflation no problem
speculative investment example. Let's say you purchase an asset in order that you will be 10% better off from its sale in the near future. So you're a speculator, you're buying things cheap, you're selling them at a higher price. And let's say you want to get at least a 10% return in real terms uh, for the sale of that product. Let's say you also know that inflation is 4%. You want to be 10% better off. So it means that you'll need to sell your asset for 14% more than you bought it. Okay? You want to be 10% better off? You know inflation is going to go up by 4%. Prices are going to go up by 4%. If you want to be 10% better off, then you need to make a return of 10% plus 4% to deal with the inflation. Right? To account for that inflation which is 14% in total. And if you can do that, you're unaffected. Right? You sell the product at 14% and you get the 10% return, the 10% being better off, that you, went, that you wanted in the first place. As long as you know that the inflation rate's going to be 4%. Okay, that's all fine. But what if inflation is unpredictable? What if it's unanticipated? Well, then it becomes problematic. Now there's going to be problems associated or that arise out of inflation itself. So there can be costs. So if inflation is unpredictable, it means decision-making in forming contracts, especially long-term contracts, decision-making is going to become riskier because you never know what your final outcome is going to be. So take the speculator, for example. They were saying, they were thinking to themselves, I want to get a 10% increase. Uh, I want to be 10% better off from this, from, uh, this deal. So um, I'm buying the product. Uh, I know that inflation is going to be 4%, so I've got to sell at 14%. Well, what if you sell at 14%, but the inflation rate is 14%? Are you any better off at all now? No. If it turns out the inflation rate was 14%, then you actually made nothing. But you didn't know that ahead of time. So you're gambling. So if that's the case, then due to risks being in existence, because you don't know the inflation rate, so you don't know what your real returns are going to be. You don't know what the real increase in your wage is going to be. You don't know what the real return on your speculative investment is going to be. You don't know what the real return on your long-term productive investment is going to be. So a long-term productive investment, by the way, it simply means, say, building a factory and so on, uh, investing in a factory uh, to produce goods and services for profit where you get, say, 10% uh, profit per year or whatever. So if you don't know what the inflation rate is going to be, you don't know what your real return is going to be. Now, that being the case, there is the fear of unanticipated losses by all sorts of groups. Right? By lenders, because lenders don't necessarily get the real interest on their loan that they thought they were going to get. Savers don't get the real interest on their savings that they thought they were going to get. Okay. Exporters face risks because if they're trying to sell at a price, a product at a certain price, uh, they set a contract with their overseas buyers to supply the product at a certain price. If then inflation occurs within Australia, the prices of all the products that they that they have to buy to put into the input process, and the prices of the products which they would buy from the that they intended to buy from the profits of their exports, all of those products have now increased in price in an unanticipated way. So the exporter can lose out of that, and workers of course can lose if they ask for a pay rise of three percent, and then the inflation rate turns out to be eight percent then the workers are actually, in real terms, taking a pay cut. 
So it's a risky situation and there's that fear of loss. And when there's that fear of loss by forming a long-term contract, which you can't get out of, and then getting smashed by inflation, people are less likely to take long-term contracts. They're less likely to take out long-term contracts. So they're less likely to take out long-term loans or to, to make long-term loans. A bank is less likely to make long-term loans. Savers are less likely to put their money in the bank for a long period of time. People are less likely to make export contracts. Workers won't be willing to sign long-term contracts for employment. And without those long-term contracts, it means the sorts of projects that would generate output, which would have generated output, those projects won't go ahead. Now, if those projects won't go ahead, then that will result in lost output. Output which won't occur now. And that is a cost to the economy. So, if inflation is unpredictable, this can make decision making more risky. That risk leads to fear of possible losses and that fear of possible losses leads to fewer contracts, long-term contracts being signed which would result in output than would otherwise be the case and so there is less output being produced than would be otherwise the case in which case that's a cost due to inflation. However there's a caveat that we can add and that caveat is if contracts can be written in real terms then the fear of inflation can be dissipated so how do you write a contract in real terms so the idea would be say you have a contract with your employer where you don't say I'll get a pay rise in money terms of three percent over the course of the year um, and hopefully inflation will uh, not rise above 3%, so I won't be any worse off. Yeah. But rather, you could write a contract which says, whatever the inflation rate is for the year, I get a pay rise of that amount, so that I'm no worse off. You could write a contract in those terms. You could write a contract for wages, you could write a contract which includes a loan, for, which includes interest rates, so you would say, whatever the uh, inflation rate is for this year, the uh, interest rate I will pay will be some amount pegged to it. You could do that. And if exchange rates are flexible, that is, exchange rates can adjust automatically with changes in prices. If that's the case, then there's less fear of inflation. And if there's less fear of inflation, then people can sign long-term contracts. If they sign long-term contracts, then you can have that output being produced, in which case there's no cost or very little cost due to inflation. As you can see there, part of that story is that the, say, the, the rates in a contract, so the interest rate or the wage rate or exchange rates in a contract, they have to be flexible. And that's, you'll find why some economists are such big fans of flexible exchange rate, flexible wage rates, flexible ex um, way, uh, interest rates. Uh, because it attempts to eliminate the fear associated with inflation.